God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
manners of ethical behavior among Christians are inextricable from the expression of genuine faith. God has chosen to honor the poor. Christians are reminded to live under the perfect law of liberty and to act with mercy. A reading from the letter of James. My brothers and sisters, do you act, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person of gold rings and in fine clothes come into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, stand there, or, uh, or well, sorry, wearing the fine clothes and say, how are you here, please, while the one who is poor, you say, stand there, or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Listen, my brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name of those who look over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good is the good of that? But what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then Jesus said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went away by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took the man aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and then he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephipah, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. And then it 
name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Amen. For these Sundays in September, our epistle reading, our letter reading, is from the book of James, or as it's commonly called, the letter of James. Which is unfortunate, because other than a few other times, occasional times in the lectionary, we only hear passages from James, and indeed most of it, in this year B of the three-year cycle. So in other words, it won't be another three years till we get to hear it as much as we do this month. Which is too bad, because James is a rich and intriguing and challenging letter. It is an unusual one in the development of the Christian church. It addresses early Christian practices and struggles, theological <coughs> struggles, philosophical struggles, ethical struggles over giving, and wealth, the care of neighbors and the poor, the Christian responsibility to, and challenge indeed, to extend care beyond the immediate Christian community. It is in the form of wisdom literature, so it shares the same style and genre as the Proverbs reading at the beginning of our worship, wise sayings and teachings brought together. And it is addressed to the dispersed Christian community. The very beginning of the letter says to the twelve churches in the Decapolis. So it is, it is kind of a gear shift. The church is now becoming less of a home-based private religion and more of an established organized religion. The identity of the author isn't really known. It is not by Paul. Uh, all of the epistles are not by Paul. We know that. Assigning the name of James, however, by the unknown author, may have been an effort to extend the authority of the letter to James, the brother of Jesus, the first bishop of Jerusalem. James has a central point in his brief five chapters. It answers the question, does the Christian faith demand that Christians take care of those in need who are not Christian. Does it demand that? You might have heard of the expression, charity begins at home. You know, so there's always a tendency to want to take care of our own kind first. Those who we belong to our particular circle, would be a community, be a state, be a nation, be a neighborhood. The struggle for the very early Christian community, which really did start meeting in people's homes, and had its own worship and signs of itself from Judaism, that was one of the real struggles. Should it continue to take care of more or less exclusively of those Christians in the empire, or did it have an obligation to extend its hospitality to, as we would say, Gentiles? those now who are not only not Jews, but not Christians. Does care and charity depend upon Christian membership? <coughs> Jesus taught that love and hospitality should be shown to all. But that was before Christianity has become a movement and is organized and becoming systematic, a divine body of believers. Someone says the greatest impediment to mission is too much structure and organization. The Episcopal Church is going to be wrestling with that same question under a new presiding bishop. Does one need to become a Christian before one can benefit from all that membership provides? You know how you're invited to join something as a member? You know, you may want to go shop in the gift store, but they said, well, wait a minute, have you considered becoming a member of our institution? Because only members get the following things. Discounts in the store, half off on Monday, travel advice, points on your credit card, on and on and on, the benefits of membership. 
That's what happens in the very first lines of James this morning. Church has put on, and all the fine clothes of the evil are there. And yet someone comes in who clearly does not belong to the group. My brothers and sisters, do you favor those who you think really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? And it goes on to say, if a person who comes in who looks like they belong, and then you greet them and say, gee, welcome, good morning, remember, membership has its benefits. And if a poor person comes in who is not one of the crowd, and you say, could you sit here on the floor by the door? Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil? I may have told the story before, but again, it only comes around every three years, so indulge me. I was at a pretty swanky Episcopal church in Boston many years ago for an institution of the rector. Um, it was glorious, it was grand, it was amazing. The incense was flying around the room. The sermon had begun, and much to everyone's consternation, what appeared to be a homeless woman came in the door and worked her way kind of down to my pew. People kind of doing this, you know, rolling their eyes. A certain older following her, I'm sorry to say, she went all the way down to the front pew, because in the Episcopal Church, the front pew is always horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and sat down, and then out of the bag, opened a prayer book. And began following the service. There was a parallel discussion about this members only whom we help conversation on the theological side, and I'm going to let you in on this without having to go to seminary, and that is called the discussion or debate between faith and works, or faith versus works, as it can be known. Faith defined perhaps as the full and unconditional belief in salvation through Jesus Christ. Works. Any efforts by deeds or actions in response to a desire to become Christian or to maintain one's Christian faith. Or another way to define it, faith. A purely intellectual and spiritual acceptance of Jesus Christ without adherence to laws, demands, regulations, or ritual behavior at least at first versus works, which are a response to the call of Jesus, love, care, and action, of things done to help others, and thereby living a Christian life. This is not a new discussion. This is something at the heart and soul of the Christian enterprise and the Christian debate. It has been a long, long discussion in Christianity. It's a chicken and egg question, you see. Which comes first? Do you do good things? Do you live a good life? Do you do all the right prayers? And do you attend church faithfully? And then do you help your neighbor? Or do you have to have faith from above? Do you have to be informed by salvation? Do you have to accept your Savior, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior? And then you are empowered to do good things. The works of religious endeavor, religiosity by themselves, aren't exactly enough. And Paul, in his teaching, established that indeed faith comes first in the sense that salvation through Christ is available to all who accept him as Lord and Savior. You can't buy your way into heaven, Paul essentially said. The baptismal liturgy reflects this. Sponsors speak on behalf of children. Adults speak for themselves. The critical question is answered, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord? So people who fell down on the faith argument said Paul was right. But you have to read Paul carefully. He also said this in Ephesians. For by grace you are saved by faith, not of your own strength, but it is the gift of God. Also in Ephesians. Salvation by faith first, then those saved by grace through faith must move forward with the works of God prepared for them. Must is in the imperative. 
You have no choice. You have to do it. And later in Galatians, the Christian life is expressed and shown forth by deeds of charity. And also in Galatians, love of one's neighbor fulfills the law. So we have to have both. We have to have faith. I mean, faith draws us. Faith brings us here on Sundays. Faith allows us to see a plan in God's salvation. Faith sees God's work in us. But we also have to do something about that. By loving and serving our neighbors as ourselves. There's been some good analysis of the role of Christianity in American public life. One aspect of this public life that you might have heard of lately is a kind of resurgence in what we call Christian nationalism. Which rises and falls with the culture. It's been around for, oh, 225 years. The question, is the U.S. a Christian nation by some virtue of its founding? Should Christianity be established as the organizing principle of the government? In other words, is the United States inherently in some way Christian? And is that sufficient for its citizens? But several studies and interviews of Christian nationalist believers reveal that few, if any, are actually active in Christian communities of faith. Now, this is an irony. You would think if you were a Christian nationalist or had those leanings, you would be front and center in your local parish church of whatever flavor that happens to be. But no. 50 to 80 percent respond that they do not belong to the church do not attend worship at all or seldom, they do not know Christian-based doctrines, and they do not subscribe to any role for Christianity in helping people in need. It's a political movement. Or we might say it's a quasi-ethnic kind of definition of a group that seeks political persuasion, but not based in any understanding of the gospel and its broadest sense, or of the faith of Christian practice. On the other hand, if you do get some folks of the Christian national persuasion who do belong to a church and worship regularly and participate in the Christian endeavor, their responses to specific questions are much different. They are supportive of policies that care for the poor. They are open to immigration with some control and vetting. And they see Christianity and the government in a partnership for trying to take care of the people of this country. A strong Christian government for them shows compassion and promotes the well-being of its people. The difference seems to be engagement in the Christian community, which is exactly what Paul wanted. So, We'll leave the final word on this discussion about James and whoever James was and James's thoughts on this because I happen to think the writer of James knew very well that this was going to endure and be controversial for centuries. So put some words on paper that people will read every once in a while. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and we'll pray for you, I'll let them. And yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. May our faith not be dead, but may be filled with the power of God. To the work that Jesus Christ has given us to do. In the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. What do we believe? We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternal God from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the God of the Almighty, of one being the Father, who through him all things for me. Salvation, you need not have a plan.
stand in God's presence, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the whole people of God, that each one may be a true and faithful servant of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. For our country, that the Lord will help us to contribute to its true growth and well-being, let us pray to the Lord. For the whole human family, that we may live together in justice and peace, let us pray to the Lord. For our families and friends, that the Lord will give them joy and satisfaction in all that they do, let us pray to the Lord. For those drawing near to the light of faith, that the Lord will bring them to true knowledge of himself, let us pray to the Lord. For those who are lonely, sick, hungry, persecuted, or ignored, that the Lord will comfort and sustain them, let us pray to the Lord. We have birthdays or anniversaries this week. You're very blurry back there. <laughs> birthday? Birthday, Sarah, wonderful. Anyone else? Oh God, we offer joyful thanks for Sarah. We rejoice with her and join in celebrating her birthday. Grant that she may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen her trust in your goodness all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'd ask your prayers especially for our country. I ask your prayers for all the faithful departed, for those uh, who died in Georgia, in the shooting, for the young man and his family, uh, for yet another horrendous tragedy, for wisdom and grace to enact the policies that will help prevent these things in the spirit of James, making good works. Let us pray for that. I ask your prayers uh, for Jim Vite, who died last week. Um, we believe his services is coming Saturday, but Deb and I have to talk about that. So don't, uh, yeah. Maybe not. Anyway, we'll have a service for sure. So Deb, Deb and I need to meet to talk about that. So we pray for you. And also a year's time for Peter Groschner Priest. I'd ask in our diocese, to pray for the clergy and people of Trinity Church Monroe, St. Philip's in Rochester, and the act of communion to the church in Myanmar. And for those on our prayer list, Ed, Lynn, Stuart, Anne, Karen, Donald, Bill, and Christopher. And please remember now before God the names of all others you wish to remember and hold up. Also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful God, in your compassion. to love and serve you by caring for our sisters and brothers, open our hearts in compassion that you receive our petitions of intercession and our prayers of penitence. Hear us as we call to you this day. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. May God's peace be with you always.
very uh, conservative with paper, on the back of the musical insert are a few announcements. So please take this with you, and then after you read the announcements, you can put this in your refrigerator, and you can hum glory to you during the week. <laughs> so by next week, it will be just right there in your singing. Um, we uh, will be having our first lunch at last night of the season on September 19th. Uh, it's only taken me about a year to converge calendars, but Arthur Bryant and Valerie Kindle are both coming to be with us, the mayors respectively of Rose Point Woods and Harper Woods, just to have a chat and fill us in on what's going on in our communities, and they'll be ready for questions and answers. So that should be a great start for the fall season. Uh, the book group is meeting on October 19th, an explanation there about the book that are reading. Uh, and we are still working, I uh, sent out some pictures in the, the newsletter on uh, the LED conversion of bulbs and new lighting for the bell tower. And Derek Carr, the man with a mission, uh, goes out and gets solar lights and we've been experimenting with that. So just to let you know that that is in the works. The jammers meet on the 24th, Tuesday, and we have tentatively planned a potluck supper on Wednesday the 25th. So I will be talking with people about that, whether we can get that date or whether we need to move a little further into October. So there you go. Those are some of the things that are happening in the neighborhood, as Mr. Rogers would say. <laughs> are there anything else I've missed? Any other announcements? Remain seated, please, for the uh, choir anthem. Let us with gladness present the offerings of our life and labor unto the Lord.
to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Thank you, Redeemer of all. We lift our hearts in thanks because you open our ears to hear your voice and release our tongues <coughs> to sing your praise. You created the earth as a place of nurture and safety for all your creatures. You called your people from slavery and wilderness to covenant and abundant life. You gave your children manna to share, and from the crumbs that fell from their table, you made a banquet of welcome for all to share in the joy of your companionship. You made the body of your crucified and risen Son a pledge of your mercy and the sign of our redemption. And so we proclaim the triumphs of your grace, joining with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven in the hymn of your eternal glory. <laughs>
be with you. Thanks be to God. Important 93.